So good morning. Um, my name is Kenny Grip, and I'll be talking about um, expert troubleshooting, resolving MySQL problems quickly. Um, does everybody who doesn't hear me well? I mean, everybody's okay. I can hear myself, so that's good somehow. Um, just to start, uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or just yell or whatever, um, and I'll, I'll gladly explain more or go slower, go faster. Uh, it all depends on, on how good I slept. I might go, might go really, really fast. I also have some swag to take along, but I was throwing, going to throw those things around, but everybody has a laptop, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, I know myself, so I would certainly hit some laptop or something like that. But feel free to come and grab some at the end. I've got plenty of stuff. Even, I even have a book to give away for the best question or the one who asks the most useful questions. So really, um, don't hesitate. You can win this thing. I've got more for talks later on today. So the more you come, the more chance you have, of course. OK, about the talk. So here's the, um, the over, uh, the, yeah, the things we'll be talking about today. So um, first, I'll go and explain a little bit more about a problem. Um, it's very important when you troubleshoot something and you want to resolve something that you know what that something means, what that problem is. Um, based on that, we'll go into instrumentation, how to measure things, how to get more insight in your database. Uh, and then we'll go into different kinds of problems that you might have with a MySQL database or a MySQL database architecture. Um, I'll be talking about how to look into optimizing or how to get more insight in optimizing an individual uh, slow query how to look into global performance problems. And then the special one is how to look into intermittent performance problems, um, because they are really hard to catch sometimes and really hard to, to find out what is going on, uh, what is causing this, and so on. OK, let's start with the problem. So um, the thing is, find out what the problem is. That's the first thing, of course. But it's not usually what, what others say. So uh, when working a, as a consultant at Procona, we often have uh, customers come in and say, hey, something doesn't work. Please fix it. So usually I kind of not trust or just don't try to be not to believe them what they say. And because sometimes they say that a certain problem is something, but it's usually something different. It's very confusing how I speak. but. Um, I'll go into an example. Um, it's not related to MySQL. It's related to Tomcat. And it's a, a conversation I had with one of my good friends on IRC. Um, and the thing he said, he's, he's managing some Tomcat servers uh, for his job. And he says, connections to Tomcat stay open. That was his problem. So the reason what, why he said that was apparently what, that's what he posted on IRC is, Look, I have a lot of connections in close weight, about 82. Uh, I'm not going to go into any details on if that is a lot, if that is a problem or not, but you'll find out that sometimes this thought process that some people make are, is completely different than what I would do. Um, so connections are open. So um, he checked LSOF, so he listed the open files, um, see which uh, process ID was, was actually having certain connections open, and he saw that it was Tomcat. OK, so it's Java process. So his solution immediately was, let's reduce time wait. Now, I'm not going to go into much specifics on networking, and I'm not a real expert on that, but changing the time wait uh, timeout, which you can change with the kernel setting in Linux, is not going to resolve that close wait. So I was kind of like, why, why are you doing this? Calm down, calm down. So, I asked him, what is the, real, what is the problem, really? Um, so he said, and that's something more that we get now, it's a problem with the Tomcat connection pool. So OK, so first, Tomcat was the problem because of some close weight. Now it's something with the connection pool. OK, there's a lot of connection pools in, in Tom, Tomcat. He says the connections stay open. OK, so I asked him, how do you know that? How do you know if, 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 if those connections stay open? And, and what useful is this to the application or to, to what, yeah, what is going on? Well, he mentioned that he couldn't see anything in an er error log. So yeah, I don't see a big problem there. He didn't have any other information to give, so I kept on bashing him. As <laughs> um, and he got a little bit annoyed after a while anyway. but. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't mind. He knows me. Um, so 
I continue to ask, okay, what is the real problem? Why are you investigating this? Because I don't see the problem right now. So he went to Tomcat doesn't respond. Okay, how do you know Tomcat doesn't respond? And then finally, we had the problem after about a half an hour chatting on IRC is the login pages keep on loading. Okay, that's useful. So the application was a web application and login was going really, really slow. So at least we have the problem now. So it, it sometimes takes a while to actually find out what that real problem is. So in some examples I'll show you later on based on MySQL, you'll see that it's kind of the same. We need to know what is going on, and that's why we have the seven, uh, second chapter, of course, uh, instrumentation. So what do we learn out of this? So find out what the real problem is. So what really happens? What's really going on? Um, so the vague definition problems that often happens, or maybe it is because of the, the person escalating this to you, or the information you know, or the experience you have, of, or others have, is not that technical. Maybe it's, a, it's, it's your boss that comes to you who's, who's totally not technical and say, hey, there's a problem there. So you have to be really careful when, when listening to what they say. So don't trust computers, humans, and yourself. So computers give false information sometimes, but um, yeah, maybe more is don't trust the humans and yourself. So really try to uh, have data to back up your thoughts. Really try to prove it. So you might guess, sometimes you might guess that, okay, the connection pool, it is related to garbage collection that kicks in, and uh, that's why connections don't, don't close. It's a guess. I'm, I'm guessing here. So it might, might be cause that, uh, what, what is causing the problem. But yeah, as, as long as you, you guess, you're not really learning anything. You're lying to yourself because you, you think that you know the problem. And I think it's, it's more important for you uh, as a, when you're working with, with, with investigating uh, issues is the more you, you investigate and the more you try to prove yourself, the more you'll get experience, the more confident you'll be in, in, in getting to know that technology. And it's, it's basically the same with, with anything and also with MySQL. So second chapter, instrumentation. Let me get some water here. So it's all about measuring. Um, so what is instrumentation? So instrumentation, that's a kind of a definition on Wikipedia, is the branch of mechanical engineering that deals with measurement and control. Okay, that's basically the definition. So another example, a quote from Tom DiMarco, is you can't control what you can't measure. So when you're managing something as a, as a system engineer, and I, would, I know this is a more developer-oriented conference, but I, I believe a lot of uh, people that are developers also do some system administration uh, from time to time. Um, so it is important that you know that you can have data to back up everything. So, Example is a car. So all cars give you basic information. So how fast is my car going? Uh, how far have I gone so far? Um, how much fuel am I consuming? What's the temperature of the engine? And so forth. There's a lot of things there that really are interested to know. So why do we need to instrument? Um, here's an example. If we've got a bunch of web service and only one MySQL database. So the problem here is it takes 15 seconds to log in. OK, so what is the problem? Somebody knows what the problem is? Tell me. No? You can win a book? <laughs> no? Yes? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, maybe too many connections to the database. It's a, it's a guess. And probably you'll, you'll say, OK, it's related to the database. And you'll probably re be right, because OK, MySQL looks as if there's only one MySQL server. It kind of usually is related to the database, but we didn't prove yet. So it's true. You'd probably be, be right. There's much more challenges on a database than on a, on a web server, which you just add more web servers to scale more. In a database, this is much, much more difficult to achieve. Um, so OK, our previous experience, and that's what you did, which is kind of good, um, is OK, uh, it's probably the database, but we're, we're kind of still didn't prove that yet. So it's better to actually know that. So let us go a little bit into deep, deeper into this. OK, so it's interesting to know what happens during that login phase. So what is the 
flow of information that happens between every component. How, how, how does it interact with the web server? Is there a load balancer in front of it? Uh, how does it make connections to a database? Maybe there's a proxy uh, in front of it. Here it's simple. We only have, sorry, uh, web servers and database servers. So we Im imagine that there's nothing, no, no other layer in between. Um, so actually, it would be good if we can know in a sequence diagram, as, as a ex simple example here, is how which state or what things is the application or that request, that login request doing uh, at each different layer of, of, of the application architecture. So we can see that the browser submits a login form. It takes a little while, I don't say a, a lot, on the web servers to process this, to start uh, executing that task. And then it makes the connections to see, is the, is, does the user exist, which goes pretty fast. And you can see uh, further down is that there is a something that says update the last login date. And that takes the most time, because it's the longest bar. So we look at time here. Um, so that's the problem. We know, OK, last login date is taking a long time. So this must be related to the database, because we are the application is waiting on the database uh, to update that last login date. So OK. Um, this is a small task. L updating the last login is maybe not that useful to your business. And maybe you can just remove that. That might be one fix for it. Um, but this is a pretty simple task, something that is often being done. I mean, last login date, pretty basic, right? But it can uh, cause a problem on the database. So let's do some analysis. Here we have the, the, the query, uh, the update. So we just set the last login date to now. That's basically it. Um, so that's the schema. Um, create table users. There's a lot of columns. I omitted a lot of them. Uh, but the last one is last login date. And we have the username, of course. Um, so it's a my, uh, my ISM, um, store, uh engine. Um, so it's, let's see when we do show process list. So you can see that the update is running. There's a lot of up those updates running. And you can see that, I, I think it's pretty clear, the first one is me running show process list. The second one is an updating state for about two seconds. And all the rest is locked. So we are using MyISM, a storage engine. So this means this is table level locking. So only one write can happen at the same time. And it will lock all the other writes. That's basically how it is. And you can see that it is kind of slow. There's a lot of causes to this, of course. Um, it, it could be slow I.O. It could be, yeah. Um, something to do with a very large table and updating the, the, the secondary indexes takes a long time. So there's a lot of things that could cause this. But not going into those specific of that issue, if you look at uptime, which might be, uh, which shows you the load average, you might have metrics to show you that, you can see that load average is still 0 0.88, uh, one minute average, which is still pretty low. So if you only would look at load average, you can say, OK, but the database is not the problem. So we need more information. The next thing we can do is we can actually go and look, um, OK, slow queries. Uh, let's take the slow query log. So the slow query log is, is a log in MySQL that actually writes all the queries that take longer than a certain amount of time. So let's say a query takes longer than one second. It will be written to the slow query log provided that you set long query time, so long underscore query underscore time, to 1. Um, so here we can see that this slow query is, is mentioned 3. So maybe the long query time was, was larger or small, uh, larger than 2 seconds, because we can see here that everything is 2 seconds. The interesting thing here with the slow query log is that the time it's a query was locked does not count for long query time. So even though it is the queries take a long time, they're not logged, because executing that query does not take longer than the configured two seconds. So that's an interesting thing here. OK, so um, some problems don't come with load. That's something here. So utilization rates does not really show you that this is the problem. So Guessing, we're still guessing. Um, so how can we get more information? How can we get more insight to just prove this? Uh, the thing here is it's just a, a score of somebody that filled in C on his test. But the, the, the start of the, the introduction said that only A or B should be filled in. So some people do it, just guess C. And yeah, fail, 0 and 100. 
So some related concepts to uh, instrumentation. Uh, I'll put the slides online. They'll also be on the website, so there's no need to take pictures. Um, so some related concepts. So load is how much work is incoming, how much uh, backlog is there. Then we have utilization is how much system resources are we currently using, how much CPU are we currently using, how much disk are we currently using. Scalability is what is the relationship between that utilization, so how much resources we use, compared with R, which is the response time. So um, the more you scale, or the more you want to scale, uh, it's dependent on your resources and also on the uh, response time. A uh, bit more uh, on detail on, on the next slide. Throughput is how many tasks can we do um, in a certain amount of time. Concurrency is how many uh, tasks can we do at the same time? And capacity is how much can we increase or can we put throughput without making all of the other things unacceptable? Like, for example, response time. So what we have here is R is the time it takes to do a task. X is task, so throughput is the task. How many tasks can we do in a certain amount of time? So throughput is not the same as performance. So you could measure the throughput um, of your system, and you could see nothing in there, even though you have a problem. But it is important to also have uh, the response time of that request or that request measured. So more throughput doesn't mean better performance. So we need to have some kind of relationship between all of those, because if, if we put more throughput on, response time will increase because the resources are more heavily used. So it's a kind of a balance that you need to find there. So uh, when we're talking about response time, we also have to include queuing. So if there's uh, a, a query waiting to be executed because it was locked, just like the previous, previous example, you have to include that as response time as well. Um, the best thing to do this and to have insight on that on the database is actually to put it in the application because the application is the center of, 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 of the whole application. So uh, if it's a PHP, it's better to include instrumentation in your code to actually measure what the database is doing because the database doesn't have a good view on what kind of task it is doing. I mean, not by default. There are some things that we can do to do that. More on that later on. I have an example. So what can we measure in the database? Um, we've got the error log. We can see, is some kind of query uh, causing an error? Maybe MySQL is crashing. That's, that's one example. Uh, we have show global status, which shows you global counters. Um, they increase. Maybe threads connected. How many connected threads do we have? Um, another example is queries. How many queries per second are we doing? Um, more on that later on. I'll have some examples. We have, when you're using inodb, show engine inodb status. It contains a lot more um, counters, again, uh, which might or might not be in show global status. It's kind of an more difficult to read. I uh, have some examples, but it contains a lot of information. It contains information about the transactions that it is running, which locks it, it, it has, some internals, inodb internals, which, which might be useful to you. Um, more examples later on. We've got the operating system metrics. So we've got load average, uh, how much memory did we use, how much I.O. are we using, again, more later on. And then how do we measure that performance? So we want to measure response time. And in the application is the most easy way to do it, and it gives you the most detail, maybe, or, or in the web server, as an example. Here's an example of, of a, uh, yeah, uh, an, application performance monitor, which is very basic. It's called instrumentation for PHP. I have a link on the, on the next slide. Um, basically, what it does, for every task um, that you do in your code, you, you log a kind of entry like this. For example, the IP is the first column. So the IP who did that request, that web request. Then we have the server IP, which server or web server did execute this task. Might be related, of course. Um, then we have the, the, the page that we're doing. So it's boardreader.com um, slash s slash nba29k. So this is the web page that was requested. So it's useful information. Then we have some time timings here. So we can see that the, 
wall time is 242 milliseconds, so W time. MySQL time was actually uh, 4 milliseconds, 4.4 .4 milliseconds. Um, Sphinx time, so Sphinx is a full text search engine, um, which might be done, uh, might be a, an, a storage engine inside MySQL, but it is also a separate um, search engine, was actually 83 milliseconds. Um, so what we know there is that from the, it took 240, uh, 242 milliseconds, and if we want to try to optimize the database, we can see, okay, we can win four milliseconds here if we can completely em eliminate the time it takes for the database. So if we try to optimize this, um, it might be better to optimize Sphinx because we have more benefit if we optimize the Sphinx search. So it's uh, interesting information to see where you need to focus when you do performance optimization. Now, to continue, we've got more information like when this was logged, uh, which user agent that was running this, and then we also have a page type. So this was a search, so the, the, the second last one from the bottom um, is search. So what we can do is we can get some metrics out of this. We can, we can actually measure 95 percentiles out of this. How long was it on the database? For every type of it, we can say a search type is that that is that response time that it takes. Maybe a login type is much faster. So we can try to identify where is that response time on the database coming from or from other layers in your application. Um, you can look at different times of the day, maybe, or different days of the week. You can measure how is the response time related uh, to, to other days. So here you can really see how that's, this affects and uh, see how, how, how good or bad your response time is. So we've got some uh, instrumentation tools that I recommend. Um, application performance monitor, I'm, I'm using instrumentation for PHP here. It's very basic. It, it's basically this, what it, what it collects. You have to make some changes in your application, of course, and it writes to a uh, different custom log in, in Apache, for example, and then uh, you load it into the database. That's, that's a basic thing. You've got New Relic, for example, as an application performance monitor. It gives you a lot of information there. Um, or you can write your own. Uh, it's pretty basic on how to achieve this, of course. Now, individual slow queries. So how do we... So I'm going, shifting away from, from that global picture, uh, application, everything. Uh, we just go, we have a query that is slow. How do we investigate a, a, a query? How, we, how do we know that it is slow? How, how do we make it faster? So what would you do when you have a query that is slow? Does anybody know? Explain, explain. Right, anything else? Yes, profiling, that's a good one. We've got a few more. No? Yes. On the what? The indexes, we can check the indexes, uh, which will you use, you'll use explain as well to, to, to analyze which index it's using. Maybe we can, by using explain, you'll look at your, your indexes. A little bit, I'll, I'll show you some examples. So what, what I have here, it's, it's, it's the most common list here, is we've got explain. So what explain does, we, we add explain in front of our select. So it, and up until MySQL 5.5, .5, so in MySQL 5.6, you can only explain selects. Uh, in 5.6, you'll be able to um, explain insert, delete, update, replace. Um, so it is a release candidate at this moment, MySQL 5.6. So at, when we look at explain, um, it will not really run the query or will partially run the query, and it will show you which, um, what, what the choice of indexes that it will use. How will it execute this? Here, if we do a join, we'll see which order it will execute this. I have an example that I'll show you. The next one is show session status. So what it does it is, when we look at it, explain, we look at what the intention is that MySQL has, how it will run it, with show session status, we actually can figure out how much row operations did it do, how much um, index entries did it read, how much sorting was done. So there's a lot more post analysis, as, as I would say. So it's still quite limited in MySQL 
uh, compared to other ancient uh, my, uh, databases, uh, but this will give you a lot more insight, more, more examples, of course. Profiling, as mentioned, um, show profiles. We can see how much time was spent in different states of the database. And then we've got a uh, slow query log. By default, in uh, Oracle MySQL, the slow query log only uh, shows you a limited amount of uh, counters, like how many rows it examined, how many rows it was returned, and how long it took to execute. So in Procona Server, there is more enhanced statistics available. In MariaDB, it has similar options, and it will give you all that counter information from the second one, from show session status. It will be available in your slow query log. That's an interesting one. So explain. Um, so we have a, a select, uh, which we do on two tables, on cast underscore info, and we join with title. So if we explain this, you can see that there's two rows. Row one is um, the first. By, this is a, a simple example. There is, there is much more uh, uh, special cases with subselects, dependent subselects. But I'll just use a, a simple join here. So what we have is the first row is, uh, is a select type simple. So it will actually start using the cast underscore info table to run the query. It will start with cast info. Then for every matching row, by filtering on um, person ID, so we've got group by cast underscore info dot person underscore ID. Uh, that's something that we have. We have, uh, that's actually the only thing we can actually, can't actually filter anything. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a group by. Um, so what we see here is it will actually read everything that matches in cast info and then for every matching row that matches the, the where clause, which is just title kind ID, it will go to the title table. So it's a nested loop joint. So for every matching row in table one, we go in table, into table B and continue the process of filtering out and selecting the data that we need. So we can see that um, cost underscore info is the first table. For every matching row, we go to title table and we go uh, and look by the information we have from the cost underscore info table. And this is a, a join on title.id. So title ID is passed on to the title table. And then uh, a where clause, you, you can actually do select star from title where ID is. And this is the ID coming from the first table. So this gives you some more information. Um, more on that is, of course, on the, the MySQL, uh, dev.mysql.com on how to analyze this. There's also some slides available um, on procona.com or um, planet.mysql.com to, to actually see more examples on, on how to optimize those. But it gives you an indication on how will the database run it? What does the optimizer choose? Um, in fact, to actually be, be, be much more efficient, you would think, is that we have a where clause on title.kindid. So why don't we start with the table title? We can already filter out everything that is kind ID not equals to one. So maybe that's more efficient. In this case, maybe uh, there is not enough indexes. Maybe we need to add an index, like you mentioned, to actually make sure that the title table comes first. Um, so the second table will be the cast info table. So it might read a lot less rows. The, the explain output also mentions, and um, I, usually I run around and jump, but I can't jump that high. Maybe I can do like this. So we've got the es estimated amount of rows that it would run, uh, that it would read on the cast info table, which is eight here. And for every matching row here, it would read one um, row um, in total. So you would think here, okay, this is eight times multiplied by uh, uh, eight times plus eight times multiplied by one. This is the amount of lookups that it has to do. So that's an estimation. Um, so in, in, in inodb, this is certainly an estimation. It could be very variable. Also, yeah, um, it is pre-run. So it is not post-execution analysis that you're doing here. So I'll go a little bit further in this example, because you would think in this example, there's not much to optimize, because of we only read 16 um, uh, fields here, or do 16 lookups. But in fact, when you look at 
the post-execution analysis, it reads millions and millions of rows because of a bug in the MySQL optimizer. So this is a, a bug that was there in, in MySQL 5.1 something. Uh, it's, of course, fixed already. Uh, but it's just to show that this, you're not 100% sure that it did it like this. Maybe it's a little confusing, but here we go into the session status. Um, so what do we do is, we, we, in a MySQL command line, we type flush status, we run our select, so we, we really run it, we don't do the explain, and then we do show status like HA, a percentage, for example. So what we do here is we look at the counters, the handler counters. Um, the handler counters is actually uh, the handler interface. Um, the handler interface is the, the, the API between the MySQL core and its storage engine. So this means uh, you've got multiple possibilities of storage engines inside MySQL. You've got uh, inodb and myism being the most known ones. You've got many other storage engines available, both proprietary and, and uh, open source. So what it does, those counters, it, at that API, at that level, every time we go from the MySQL core, which executes the engine, we ask the storage engine, hey, give me the next row, give me that index, uh, that data. So by looking at the counters, we know how much data was read. So what we see here is, um, so handler read first here is read the first entry of an index. So that's interesting to know. We did once we went to the first entry of an index. Then we did um, handler read next, which, which is like 14 million. So 14 million times we did read the next index entry, read the next index entry. So this tells us that's, that we're doing a, a um, index scan, because we always say, give me the next entry, give me the next entry, give me the next entry. So um, what we also see is we read, do handler read key. So this is read a specific key with a specific value from the index. Give us that information. So that happened 13 uh, million times. So it's kind of difficult to know. We remember that query with a, a join, cost info joined on title. So maybe this is the second table. Read ID, title ID this, title ID two. So we can see this is probably on, and probably, we don't know, um, on the title table. What we can also see is handler read R&D next, which is uh, two million, about two million. So this is read the next row. Handler read R&D means a row. So it's not random or anything like that. So handler read is an index, is something to do with an index, and handler read R&D is something to do with reading a row. So we've got handler read R&D, which is read a specific row, and handler read R&D next, read the next row. So we've got a kind of a table scan going on here. So this is not using any index. Interesting to know with the select, we also have handler write, which is two million. So the interesting about that thing about that is it was a select. Why does it write? Anybody has an ID? Why? Excuse me? Temporary table, temporary table. correct. So um, that select actually generated a temporary table, and one or more temporary tables, actually. You don't know. Um, and by looking at this, we can see that the temporary table was actually two million rows big. And then that that was actually created for doing that group by. So to do that group by, it couldn't use an index, so it made a temporary table to fill that in. So in the end, it has to be shown the information from the temporary table. And that's where we have handler read RNE next, which is sort of the same um, size. So this means, okay, handler read RNE next comes from reading that temporary table. Okay? Okay, not too confusing. So this is information we have after executing it, after uh, running that query. So this really helps us. So here we only looked at the handler statistics. We've got more information about the sorting. We've got more information about temp tables, if it created them or not. So really useful here. The not other one is show profiles. So we set 
profiling equals one, just still again on a command line, um, which enables the profiling. Then we run that query again, and then we can run show profiles. And this gives you a list by default that will give you the last 15 uh, executed queries in that session. And it shows you the query ID and the duration. So it was 211 seconds to run this query. If we did show profile for query one, uh, we can look at query ID one and give more information about it. And this is what you see here. Um, so there's different states inside MySQL, and it counts the time that it has been at a current state. So we can see that 113 seconds was copying to temp table. 96 seconds was copying temp table to disk. So it was converted from memory to disk at some point, uh, maybe because uh, temp table size was uh, exceeded. So 32 megabytes, if the temp table becomes bigger than 32 megabytes, it will be converted to disk. And then uh, it needs to convert that. So that was 96 seconds. So it, it gives you some indication, although it's not always so clear what, what it is doing. Um, there are some states that actually mention freeing items, statistics, but it could be doing many other things which you don't know about. So it's kind of hard sometimes in MySQL to really, really know that difference on it. I, I actually, I don't use this so often, um, to be honest. I'm pretty, almost never. So when we look at the so sh session status, we've got slow log statistics, which is kind of similar, if, if not the same, gives you the same information. So what we have here is, is we have a, a regular slow uh, query log, and I'll have to stand here again. Um, so the query time here was 400 seconds almost. We've got the lock time, how many rows sent, how many rows examined. And this is basically what you get with stock Oracle MySQL. So with um, MariaDB and, and, and uh, Procona Server, you have a lot more added information that you can uh, add. So we don't have the handler statistics here, but we know that it did some InnoDB IO read operations. So it was about 100 read operations that it did. We know that was one temporary table, which was that big in, in bytes. So there's a lot of extra information that we have here. So it was a full table scan. Um, the temp table was created on disk. So a lot of information in there, which might you help understand. Of course, the slow query log, it can become very full. There's a lot of tools available to process that and give you the ones that you should optimize or the ones using most resources. I have some examples uh, in the next slides. Now, global performance metrics. Any questions so far? No? OK, great. So global performance problems. So for example, one, one ex example is we have the metrics already, so it's good. So we know that our 95 percentile of the response time increased from 40 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. So there's. Uh, actually four times more, uh, five times more uh, slower that the application is. So what is going on? So we can use a lot of things to actually investigate this. So we've got trending um, graphs. You've got Procona monitoring plugins, which is monitoring plugins for cacti. Uh, you've got Ganglia MySQL plugins. Um, there is Munin, Zabbix plugins, or make your own. Uh, basically, it does show engine 9ODB status and show global status and measures those metrics. Um, so other things we can do, so they are, uh, the cacti templates are actually more related to MySQL uh, or to the disk subsystem actually. Um, and we can actually look at the global things like load average, uh, disk utilization, um, anything you might get. So we've got this, we can actually um, do more. We have a lot of other tools that I'll, I'll show you here. Uh, we can look at sysstat, so IO stat, look at the IO characteristics. MP stat, look at the CPU uh, usage. VM stat, uh, memory usage. So there's a lot of things in there. Um, the other ones is, is part of the Procona toolkit, which you can just download from our website. Um, we've got PT Maxed, PT Disk Stats, IO Profile, PMP, and Query Digest. It's just one of the many, many tools that we have. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of what they mean um, in the next slides. So about trending, I have a lot of graphs. I'll just go quickly. Um, 
here we have the amount of MySQL connections. We can see that max connections is set to 500, max used connections was 330, and at some point in the middle, so between 5 April and 6 April, or uh, just at the end of 5 April, we can see that the amount of connections rose. Maybe when investigating a problem that happened in the past, you'll use the trending to analyze what was going on. So either the database was stalling or the application was misbehaving. I don't know. There's a lot of things there. Maybe it's a, a batch process that kicks in at that time. We've got more like replication. You can see that uh, on different days, there is a replication lag. There's actually a permanent replication lag in this case, which was not there uh, on Wednesday, but suddenly came there on the night between Wednesday and Thursday. The replication lag went up, and it never recovered until Wednesday when we fixed the problem. So trending gives you that information. Um, so something happened at that time. I would see maybe you launched a new application feature which caused this. Maybe you stopped the database. The replication threat was stopped uh, due to network problems. Different things can happen. Uh, temporary objects. Um, you can see that it's kind of stable. Uh, only one spike in the beginning. I don't say that every spike is a problem. Um, but it is interesting to, to see over time how this evolves. Maybe it silently went worse. It, more temp tables were created on disk. Um, those spikes that happen at regular intervals, they are caused by I don't know what. So it, it is recommended to analyze this and figure out what is causing this. And the more you understand, the more you, you'll, you'll trust your graphs and have insight. So more, um, the buffer pool. Um, you can see that at midnight, or a little bit later, uh, the buffer pool was actually empty, and it got filled again. So we can see that the database was restarted, for example, and it took a while. So it, it took about one to two, yeah, two, uh, two and a half hours to fill that buffer pool completely. So this might say this is the warm-up time uh, to warm up the database buffers again. I wouldn't say it's the warm-up time, because what is usually in your database and memory is the things that are used most. If you restart the database, it just the things that are used first. So it's not really the same. Um, you can compare this with checkpoint age. So this is the amount of uh, writes to the database that have not been flushed to the actual data yet. So you can see some behavior there. Even though uh, there was the, the, you didn't restart the database, you can see that checkpoint age here went up. So there was something that caused uh, that writing to the data files not keeping up, maybe I.O. problems, um, application load, more writes happening. Another interesting one is the query response time. Um, it's not really a good graph, but what it shows, it's actually a feature in Procona server, which you can enable. It shows you how long something, um, how long uh, the counters of everything, how many queries did we have that took between 10 and uh, one millisecond. And then we, we have uh, query time total one, for example. Total two is how long it took between 10 and 100 milliseconds, and then 100 and one second. So you can see counters on how long usually those, those queries take. So if you look at time, we can see if the pattern changed. Maybe queries went faster and moved away from, from query time total three to two to one or maybe it just became slower because we added more throughput. So there are some global statistics that give you some more information on it. Now, ptmext. Um, ptmext is actually a simple script that runs show global status at regular intervals. So, um, or show global status or MySQL admin extended statistics. So what we see here is we run it with my, we run MySQL admin x minus i10, so an interval of 10 seconds, and we do this three times. So the result will be uh, the whole list of show global status with the counters from the beginning. So the first column contains the counters. The second column contains the counters 10 seconds later, the difference between them. So for example, um, connections. Um, at the bottom, you have 250 connections created in those times 10 seconds. You've got 262 connections created 
uh, 10 seconds later. So it shows you how much was the database was using at that particular time. So it's good to actually investigate some performance problems to look at peak during peak, what is, how is the database behaving? There's much more information, like the handler statistics. If handler read R&D next is suddenly millions uh, in every 10 seconds, we can calculate, okay, if it's 8 million, there will be 800,000 uh, rows that are being read from the database every second. So it gives you uh, insight in what the actual database is performing. We have some more, like for example, query cache information, threads, thread information. So here we can see threads running. Uh, threads running is five when we started. It then got, uh, became two, and then uh, it stayed two. So you can see how this evolves over time. So maybe it peaks to 100 threads running and something is locking or something is becoming very slow. So it looks at the global behavior of the database on a specified time frame. If you look at just global status, those counters are like in the millions and, or billions, or uh, it's very hard to really get something useful out of it, because usually you have peak time and non-peak time. And if you divide the global counter with the uptime you have, there's not really a lot of information that you can tell out of it. So it's much better to use PTMEX, for example. Ooh, I only have 15 minutes left. Okay, disk subsystem statistics. Um, we've got IOSTAT, and IOSTAT shows you IO statistics. For example, how much reads do we do? How much writes per second do we have? I don't know if you can see my mouse, actually, no. Oh, it works. No, where is it? No. No, anyway. Um, so we've got reads per second, writes per second. Interesting, and they're in bold, but it's kind of hard to see, is that we have average wait and service time. So this is the queuing, and this is how long a, a typical request takes. So we've got 424 something um, milliseconds to do, on average, a read or a write request. So that's really interesting information. So uh, we actually... Oh, didn't do any reads, we did 338 writes. So that's actually pretty high for a, a simple I.O. request. Now, the, dif the difficulty uh, with I.O. stat is, or with this version of I.O. stat, it has been changed in newer versions, is that you don't see the difference between uh, reads and writes. How, how, what is, the, what is the, the, the service time for reads and writes? Because that's important. For reads, it will... Uh, it is accepted to have a couple of milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. But for writes, you want these to be for, perform fast, because usually you have a rate uh, uh, disk subsystem with a cache, and that cache will actually can give you 0 0.1 millisecond write performance. So it's a lot of uh, performance problems that we investigate is actually caused by slow disk subsystem. Maybe the write, be, uh, the write back cache uh, of the disk subsystem is not enabled. An interesting one is the last column, is utilization. And utilization here is 100%. That doesn't mean much. Um, you would say, okay, it's fully used, okay. But the thing you have there is, this is how many percent of the time was a, an op at least one operation busy. So we can see, okay, there was always one, at least one operation busy um, during that whole uh, measuring that we did. So if we have a disk subsystem with 20 disks, we can do more than one operation at the same time. So utilization is misleading. It doesn't show you how much concurrent uh, are we doing. It doesn't, doesn't give you that insight. So don't look at utilization. Um, actually, IOSTAT reads slash proc slash disk stats, and that's where we have PT disk stats. And it shows you similar information um, although what it does it is you can see the reads here. The last column is read response time, which is 5, 4.1 milliseconds. But you can also see write response time, which is 61 milliseconds in the, the last uh, two columns from uh, disk SDB. So this shows you, okay, uh, 61 write response time. I would say there's a problem. Maybe write back cache is not enabled. The battery is relearning uh, because uh, the cache needs to be protected from power loss, so it doesn't clear, so you need a battery or a capacitor. If that battery is relearning, it is actually uh, emptying itself and filling itself again, so 
it will disable that write back cache so to ensure that you, you, you don't lose any data when the power goes out, and that might cause things like this. So the similar information, again, on PT disk stats. I have some examples. Um, an example here is slow drop table. That was a problem. So uh, when a customer does drop table, the performance is really bad. Actually, the database stalls completely. So the things we know is that inodb file per table is on. So this means that for every table, a different table space is being created. And the customer is already using XFS. Thank God, is using XFS. Reason, extended tree is really, really slow in deleting files. So there's some kind of a performance problem there. OK, so he's not having extended tree, so it's not possibly related to the, uh, to the disk. We do see a lot of CPU being used. So we can look at show engine inodb status. And this is just a little part of show engine inodb status. And what we see here in the section semaphores, which shows you internal locking, internal to inodb, we can see that it's in bold. Um, uh, we have different threads having different locks or waiting to acquire different internal locks. So the database is really stalling. And we can see really at the bottom, uh, it was waiting for 51 seconds. So 51 seconds is a lot, a lot for an internal uh, locking that is happening. So there's something really, really going on. What we can do is we can look at the poor man's profiler, which is PTPMP. Uh, it was not created by Procona, but it's just on the website poormansprofiler.org. Uh, we just built it into a script to help you make it easy to run it. So what it actually does, it does a GDB backtrace and looks at the state every thread of the database is in, and then summarizes what the database act is actually doing. What we can see is that 66 is the highest amount. It's doing something along the lines of asynchronous I.O., A.I.O. Uh, so there's a lot of internal information here, but it might give us some clue. So OK, it seems to be doing something on asynchronous I.O. or waiting. I don't know, maybe disk is the problem, OK? Although when we look at I.O. stat or PT uh, disk stats, we didn't see any performance problem on the disk. So it might not show you that, but an interesting thing you see here on the bottom is uh, one thread is actually doing buff LRU invalidate table space. So it is actually invalidating a table space. Remember, uh, we're dropping a table, removing a file, a table space, because I know DB file per table is on. So might be related to that. Another tool that we can use is OProfile. OProfile actually measures where CPU was being spent. And when we look at the results, we can see 42% of the time we captured was actually busy doing that buff LRU invalidate table space. So we've got something. We know, OK, this is uh, what is causing that locking. Um, so the result is, um, so I went to the developers, showed it, and they looked into the code. I'm not really uh, a programmer. Um, so they analyzed it. And what it actually does is that when you delete a table or a table space in previous versions of MySQL and Procona server, um, it read the whole LRU, so the, the buffer pool, the least recently used. It read everything to make sure that the table that you're trying to remove, that all those entries in memory are also removed. So if you have a buffer pool about, of about 200 gigabytes, there's a lot of data that it needs to read. So that's why it takes a long time. So uh, Procona Server quickly introduced inodb lazy drop table uh, to not read and lock everything for a long amount of time. And it's also fixed in the Oracle MySQL uh, 5520. So it doesn't cause that problem anymore. However, we did that fix, but the customer still had some problems, uh, another customer then in that case. So what we did is we actually did not see that buff LRU invalidate table space. But when we look at PT Mext, we saw something along the lines of inodb mem adaptive hash uh, that actually suddenly became very active. If you would have trending, you would see it in your trending graphs. So the graphs of, of the Procona monitoring tools contain all that internal information in graphs. So it really would show you that this is not non-standard behavior. You would see that it was actually the adaptive hash was shrinking a lot. So it was actually doing the same thing in the inodb adaptive hash. Um, 
I don't have much time, so I don't go into much specific on what that ad adaptive hash is. But that was another bug that we found by using those tools. So it gives you some insight on what tools you can use to actually find out what the database, how it is behaving and everything. Um, when optimizing queries, um, we have different things. So an example is we have bad performance on one of the queries um, or on the global database, and the response time went up on your da database. So if you look at PT Next, we see, OK, handler read R&D next is big. So it's about um, 86 million for 10 seconds. So it's 8 million times, give me the next row, give me the next row. So there's a lot of table scans going on. So we look into the slow query log. And that log is, is really, really full. If you enable long query time zero, which means let's log every query that is being run on the database. Every query, give us that extended information. And you do that by enabling log slow verbosity to full. It gives you that information. So if you do thousands of queries per second, it could actually cause some problems because you're doing a lot of writes. That log be file becomes really too big. Uh, there's some settings where you can rate limit that. Uh, but what's interesting is we have a lot of those metrics now about every query that we run. And then we can use the tool PT Query Digest, which is really, really important um, to use that from time to time. Is we actually, PT Query Digest reads the slow log, and it parses it, and it looks at those different counters and gives you a, a plan. Like, this is what's using most resources at this moment. This is what. Um, does most I.O. operations. So it's really flexible. It, it can read slow query logs, bin log files, show process list, which is uh, less useful. Uh, we've got PostgreSQL. It can actually read uh, MySQL, MySQL TCP dump files, so raw TCP dump data uh, from MySQL protocol, memcached, and HTTP protocol. So it can do similar things. You can group order by all different settings. So every field you have here, you can say group by temp tables, uh, group by temp table size. So you can really find out what is going on here. Um, you can store that information into tables, um, dash dash review, um, dash dash review table. Sorry, this. Um, um, mistake there. Um, and you can filter. You can say, give me everything that did more than one megabyte uh, that was a query cache, things like that. The output that we have is something along the lines of this. So this is the, the begin output. Uh, we can see that it uh, was 800 seconds that it took to generate that um, report. Um, this is just some global statistics. On average, 15, 95 percentile is two milliseconds to run a query of all uh, 2,163 seconds that it calculated. Then it shows you a global profile report. And here we have the top nine queries uh, calculated by response time. The interesting thing that we see here is 62 per second of all execution times in total was actually caused by a select with a join on all those different tables. It took only 112 milliseconds for each call, but because we run that query so often, um, it is causing mo to use most resources on the database. So it's really, um, really not easy to say, let's give me the longest running query. It might be the one that is execu being executed most. So here we can see, OK, let's optimize the first query or remove it. And then we can save 62% of the resources used of the database. That's a lot. And usually, when we do this the first time for customers, there's just a top three of them that we can optimize. And we actually have a lot of benefit, usually more than 50% of them. That really happens a lot. So you can have a lot of benefit on that. Um, this is just a profile. Then for every query you mentioned here, you can say how much you want to show, 10, 20, 30. And it shows you a, an oversight. Uh, the first one is, is how many queries per second. Uh, shows you average, 95 percentile, deviation, medians, everything. Then it shows you query time distribution. You can see here that it had a different behavior depending. Um, so actually, half, 50 percent of the time, it took between um, uh, 100 milliseconds and one second, and the other half, it, it, it was on, along the lines of 10 microseconds until one millisecond. So maybe this select, where we select the user agent, uh, so all the uh, information here, is actually um, maybe the uh, optimizer chose to use another index. 
Maybe it chose to, uh, for, for half percent of the time, to use another index. I don't know why, it, it could be. Or maybe 50% of the time it had to come from disk and was much slower um, than uh, when running this, uh, when getting it from memory, which is much faster. So this is only uh, the query time distribution. And then you have more information on all those metrics mentioned in the slow query log. So you can see average 95 percentile is 53 milliseconds. Uh, and you have everything like lock time, rose red, merge passes, temp tables, go on. I know, I know DB IO reads uh, how many operations, how many pages it read, how many times was it coming from the query cache, all that information. OK. I still, it's usually uh, it's 59 minutes, but I still want to handle that. You can leave if you want, but it won't take too long. Um, <clears throat> intermittent performance problems. So you know how to optimize some global performance problems, and you know how which tools to use. But usually, we, we got requests like, this happens once a week in a random time. We don't know when it happens. So it's really difficult to start looking at PT Max all the time, or generate a slow query log report uh, based on a whole time, if it only happens for a few seconds. So it's really, really hard to do that. So there are some tools to actually optimize this, or to find the cause of this. OK, so how can we do this? So there are some tools in Procona Toolkit um, which allow you to actually capture data. So you can measure, you can observe, but you cannot observe everything at the same time. You cannot. Uh, capture it all the time. And the tool I'll show you is PTStalk. I'll skip some slides here. Um, and PTStalk is actually just a simple script that measures, by default, it measures threads running every second, or depending on how often you want to uh, uh, measure it, it maybe every second, check threads running. And when threads running is spiking above a certain threshold, PTStalk changes and starts collecting a lot of data. So maybe it. Um, Threads running causing uh, to spike up to 20, when usually it is one second. So we can set it to 15. As soon as it becomes higher, we start collecting everything, everything possible that we, we, we configure it to collect. And I'll show you a little bit more examples. So don't put it too low, don't put it too high. Um, just find a balance on how much you want to collect here. So threads running is good. You can use threads connected. Uh, you can do something in show process list. You can grab something and show inodb status. It actually has a feature to include any script you want. You can, you can use a special trigger, some script that you wrote. And as, as soon as it returns uh, false, or when it returns a, a non-zero exit code, it starts collecting. So you can make it anything you want. Um, so what value should we use? So here we have uh, queries, threads connected, and threads running. So the interesting thing that we see here is that uh, when this happens, when we do MySQL admin extended status, we see that this is over time, it's 700 queries per second. And we can see that it goes to 100 and then moves to 1,100. The interesting thing we also see is that threads running spikes. So queries per second drop and threads running spike. OK, so if we monitor threads running very closely until this spikes, we can start collecting data and we might find a problem and might find what is causing this. Um, you might actually do queries as well, because queries drops below a certain threshold. So you can configure it like this. Um, it can collect anything, even GDB backtraces, PTPMP, O profile information. It can collect queries, raw query data from TCP dump. It can S trace your database, but by default, they are disabled because they. If you do a GDB backtrace, it actually stalls the database a bit. And actually, it can crash your database. So by default, don't enable those. But it is useful in some cases where it's really necessary to have that information. So by default, it stores everything in varlib ptstalk. Okay? And there's a lot of data in there. And this is, this is the data that you'll have in there. Um, open tables, so show open tables. Uh, PMAP, memory mapping. Uh, process list. Um, VM stat, IO stat, um, CCTL configurations, top information, uh, variables, what, what was the configuration of the database. Um, we've got more about interrupts, about uh, inodb status. Um, what else? Everything, actually. Not related to the database only, also to 
the operating system, because this is useful sometimes. Then we have the tool PTSIFT, and PTSIFT can actually read it, make it much easier for you to read it. So there was a lot of collections that happened here. So we do PTSIFT on, a, on the table, on varlib PT, uh, PT stalk, and then it shows you all the, m the measurements. So you select one of the times that it collected data, and then it already summarizes some information for you, like VMstat first, then InnoDB. We had 10 active transactions, 310 non-active. A little bit more information about everything. And then you can go on and go into every different file. So there's a lot of files in there. So one example that I'll show you is um, there are query pileups at a certain time. There's suddenly there's high disk IO activity, and it happens randomly. It's really hard to really figure out what is causing this. So we configure PT stalk and say, okay, if threads running becomes more than 10, let's grab the get data. So what we saw in the mem info is that writeback actually dropped when that happened. So it, the writeback, this is the file system cache of the operating system, uh, how much data was not written to the disk system, subsystem yet, so it was still in the kernel um, uh, cache, so the file system cache, it went zero. Every time a uh, collection happened, this is the single thing that always was, always was recurring. So okay, this KO caused by operating system cache that was being flushed. Okay, well, very difficult. Actually, it took a long time before my colleague figured out what was causing this. And suddenly he saw that uh, there's a file called trigger, which is the, just the, the timestamp. You, you have the timestamp of when it was triggered. And you could see that the binary logs uh, were actually flushed at that time. It was actually every time 15, 15, 15, 15, 16, 17. So every time that happened, the, f the, the binary logs were flushed. So OK. After investigating um, a little bit, we saw that, OK, we know that the binary logs, or at least we know that the binary logs actually use the file system cache. It does not get written to disk immediately when, you, when the database writes to the binary logs. It is written to, um, to, the, to, the, to the disk subsystem, but the kernel decides whether it will do it now or later. So it's not crash safe. Um, unless sync bin log is equals one, of course. So actually, it, it could that write back that you saw in the, the, the file system cache could grow up to some point. So every time a new binary log was created, the binary logs that, that were older than a certain amount of time, so we have expire logs days configuration, it could be set to seven days, for example, it will actually remove all the binary logs that will all, were older than seven days. So what the, what actually happens is MySQL actually locks or takes a lock, an internal lock, which is called the lock log mutex, and it was holding that lock for the whole duration of removing those old binary logs. So we know that extended tree, it was using X3, um, is slow when it was deleting files, so it was really slow, and this is the cause of it. The binary logs were one gigabyte, so every time a, a binary log was rotated, it had to delete at least one binary log, or most likely a binary log of one gigabyte. So the larger the file, the slower it becomes to delete that file. So one solve uh, resolution was actually to make the, the binary logs only 50 megabytes. So more often that purging would happen, and it actually smoothens out that, hap uh, that, 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 that uh, holding of that mutex. And, and deleting that file or that binary log was actually much faster to do, but it happened more often. So actually, this resolved the problem here. Um, you can also switch to XFS, of course, and then you would, would not have that problem. Another example is, I'm really going over time now. Um, for example, and this is useful to developers, is we, we can have a lot of locking in, in transactions in InnoDB, and it's sometimes very difficult to figure out what is causing this. So we can enable extended slow logging, and we configure PT stalk. And one of the special triggers that uh, we once made was uh, we look on, on how many transactions were actually holding locks for a long time, how many transactions were idle for a longer amount of time. And 
when we actually when that actually happened we captured data with tcp dump and then analyzed what those sessions were doing why was that connection that particular connection um, idle for a long time what query did it first ran after being idle and that actually gave us insight to the dif uh, to the developers we were able to give the developers hey this is the transaction that is causing to loop in this case something was looping um, in the application so we can see and this is quite difficult this is show engine inodb status again and we can see that the query was active for 14 seconds this transaction sorry and it has some lock structure so it was actually having some row locks and other transactions uh, were waiting on that so i don't uh, show that here but we did see it is active for 14 seconds so a transaction that takes 14 seconds um, if you do a lot of writes to those tables, that could easily cause some locking happening, some transaction locking happening, causing to slow down your whole application. So that transaction, 14 seconds, it was not really running a query. It was just idling there. The application was doing something and not really committing the transaction. So we did write a script to parse that, and then we saw, okay, with TCP DIMP, we analyzed what was going on. We analyzed what that session was doing, because what we have here is we have the IP address and the MySQL thread ID. And when we have the MySQL thread ID, we can know which um, TCP port it was using. And by using the TCP port, we can actually look at LSOF to see, uh, or LSOF on the application server to actually see which process was owning that. So you can actually trace it back completely. You can actually figure out what was really, which thread on which application server is causing that. And this might give you some information. Other things you can do is actually add comments into your queries. So um, just regular C style comments, distract the, 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 the part in the code where you execute that query. You could easily add that and parse that. So that gives you that information. So the application was stuck in a loop. And then we helped give the development the information it needs to actually trace back the cause of it. OK, so here's a summary. Um, we have investigated the problem. We need, we need to find the problem first before we can really go and investigate better. So we need instrumentation to, to better uh, find data, to have data to, to stop guessing and try proving and finding out what behavior changed. Uh, I went a little bit in tuning individual slow queries, global performance problems, and then how to do those intermittent performance problems with PT Stalk. Here's some links that are useful. Um, any questions? It, I know it's 12.30. I have all time. I have a whole day. So any questions? No? I still have a book to give away. So <laughs> that's it then.